one of the hard things about life is that just as you get in over one difficulty, another seems to step in and take its place. It just seems to be one thing after another. So often we move from one time of crisis and straight away something else happens. And we just wish that we could have a bit of a break. I'm sure each one of us here this morning has felt like that at some point where you've just got over one thing and something else has come along. Well, when one thing seems to follow another, as Christians, we do have help. As Christians, we should always be remembering that this world is not our home. And we should expect trouble and difficulty and maybe even persecution as we tra travel through this life. Because we have to remember that our true home, the place where we're going to find peace, is when we see our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And until that point, we should expect there to be all sorts of difficult hurdles for us to cross. And there could be all sorts of things. It could be poor health, family difficulties, being unfairly treated, mental health problems, periods of unemployment, and even worldwide pandemics. Yet as we face these trials, we also know that the believer does not face them alone because they've got God on their side. And that's a really good thing. It's not a case of, yes, we're going to the end of the journey and that's when we see Jesus face to face. But the Lord is with us as we go through the difficulties and the struggles each day. And we also know that whatever happens, God is in control. He's in control of every event that happens on a global scale, on a national scale, and on a personal scale. And that means that we can be confident. We can be confident that nothing's going to happen to us that's uh, outside of God's will and outside of his control. And we can give thanks to him that because of his grace and mercy, we are on the winning side. So we've got all these things to be thankful for. And another thing to be grateful for is, of course, the fact that we don't stand alone. The Lord has called his people into congregations of people, churches scattered all over. There's the global church, the body of Christ, and then there's the local assembly. And as local assemblies of God's people, we can support one another and carry each other through. So even though, as we go through life, it may seem like there's one thing after another, We've got a lot of help, and we've got a lot of support. And this principle, that one thing comes after another, but we've got help and support because God is in control, is critical in understanding this um, dream, this vision that Daniel has in chapter 8. At first reading, we may think, what on earth is all this about? But when we start to delve down into it, this is one vision that we can understand. It's a vision that Daniel received in the third year of King Belshazzar. And this vision, in a sense, it's got some good news in it as well. Because part of it is looking forward to a time when God's people had returned from exile. The temple had been rebuilt and the daily worship was restored. Now, these uh, things would have made Daniel's heart sing because we have to remember that at the moment that he received this vision, he was essentially a slave in exile. The temple had been demolished and the people had been taken out of the land and they were living in the Babylonian Empire. So, at that moment in time, there was no worship going on. And even though there were the promises in the prophets, there was the living reality that he had of being a slave in a land that was not his own, and he was surrounded with pagans. This vision would have given him some hope, because Daniel sees restoration, but then he also sees that this restoration is not the end of the challenges his people will have to face. Instead of a long period of peace when they're left to just worship the Lord, he will see that they will have to face a new and very dangerous enemy. For the nation of Israel, it really will be one thing after another. Now, unlike the dream of Daniel 7, which is very difficult to understand, Daniel 8 is one of the more straightforward passages for us to get our heads around because the interpretation that's given in the chapter very clearly points to a period of history that is well documented 
that we know a lot about. And there's quite a few differences between the dream of cha chapter 7 and the vision of chapter 8. We see that Daniel is not transported to an unknown location where he sees a series of monsters arising out of a swirling cauldron of the sea. But instead, he's taken to a place which he would have been familiar with, Susa in the province of Elam next to a canal. And the creatures that he sees, they're not monsters, but they're familiar domestic animals, a ram and a goat. To Daniel, they would have been as familiar as seeing a car or a lorry. They're that common. They're really ordinary. Well, the first one he sees is a ram, and it's got two horns. And one of the horns is a little bit larger than the other. And at first, this ram is clearly in charge. Nothing can stand in front of it. But then a challenger appears, a goat with a single large horn. And this goat charges so quickly, its feet don't even touch the ground. And when it charges the ram, the ram's horns are broken and it is, it is powerless to defend itself. The goat then becomes very great, but at the height of its power, the large horn is suddenly broken off and in its place, four prominent horns grow up towards the four winds of heaven. And this point, which takes us up, um, up to verse 14, oh, sorry, up to verse 9, that's really the backstory. We get the important parts between verses 9 and 14. And that section is dealing with events that will happen in the beautiful land. And the beautiful land is, of course, Daniel's home. That's Judah. Out of one of the four horns, a new horn will grow, starting off small but growing in power until it challenges the host of heaven itself, even stopping the daily sacrifice. And this situation will continue for 2,300 days. So you see there that the nation of Judah have got to be back home and the temple is working again. So that's the good news for Daniel. But it must have been such a mixed message. Daniel's people, they get to go home, but that's not the end of their problems. And as he thinks about this, as he ponders it, his question is obvious. What does it all mean? And that's a big question for Daniel to ask, because we have to remember that Daniel was very good at understanding dreams. Remember how it interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's for him. And now he's given a dream which he can't understand. That must have been really frustrating. You know, when you're good at something, but for some reason you can't quite do it, that is one of the most frustrating things. So he asks for help. And then in verses 15 to 26, we get a really helpful interpretation which allows us to locate these events clearly in history. So the angel Gabriel, whose name means God's hero, is sent to him to explain the dream. And as one of God's mighty angels, his presence is overpowering for Daniel. But just like in other portions of Scripture, the Lord gives the person receiving the vision the strength to stand. And that's a reminder of the wonderful grace that God shows us, that uh, he gives us the strength that we need when we need it. And Gabriel now provides an explanation of what the dream means. Now, for Daniel, this is looking into the future. And even with the explanation, it was still clearly very difficult for him to understand. But for us, it's a lot simpler because we have the wonderful hindsight, as it were, of looking back over history. At the time of writing, when Daniel received this dream, the Babylonians were the world power. But they were an empire in decline that was about to be replaced. The Medes and the Persians were on the rise, and this is the ram with the two horns. And this coalition would eventually see the Persians take over from the Medes. So that's why one horn is larger than the other. And the Persians, they went on to have a very large and powerful kingdom. And the book of Esther was written in the time of the Persian kingdom. And that kingdom was suddenly conquered by the most unexpected enemy. For them, you know, they had these giant um, empires stretching from sort of Turkey right the way across to India. And then Europe, Europe was nothing. They were a load of nobodies. They were backward and primitive. But then, Alexander the Great, he united the Greeks, and he took on the Persian Empire. And he went to war, and Alexander the Great very quickly conquered the entire Persian Empire. You know, he went from Greece across to India. That's an incredible feat for what was a small and a relatively unknown army. And he did all of this before his death at the age of just 33. So you're doing pretty good when you can conquer most of the known world by the age of 33, aren't you? 
The GOAT is Alexander the Great. Um, he died in June of 323 BC. And then Alexander's, Alexander's empire, which did a lot of good, um, the Greek empire, which was, uh, did a lot of good, because it laid the foundations for the Roman empire. It replaced the oriental influences with a Greek culture, and intri this introduction of Greek culture and language sort of united the world. And it was the language that the New Testament would eventually be uh, written in. So Alexander the Great did a lot of good, but he died suddenly, his sons were assassinated, and he had four generals, and his empire fit, it split into four different sections. So the horn is broken off, and four arise. So we can see how that fits with uh, what happened to Alexander the Great. Now, one of the states um, was, uh, ended up being called the Seleucid Kingdom, or the Seleucid Empire, and that covered a large area that started with Israel and sort of stretched in a thin band going across modern-day Iraq and Iran. And in 175 BC, uh, are you going to sleep yet for the, because of this history lesson? <laughs> you can't tell with people's masks. You can't quite see if the eyes are dropping, can you? But um, in 175 BC, um, Antioch Epiphanes IV became ruler. And he, he gained his position by political intrigue and then by military conquest. He was a man who started out small and became very great. And he is remembered as one of the cruelest rulers of all time. In an effort to unite his kingdom, he insisted that everyone in his kingdom adopted Greek culture and Greek religious practices. And for the Jews, this meant that circumcision and the keeping of the law became illegal. And then, because Antioch had um, put one priest in charge in Jerusalem, but then another one tried to take his place, it meant that he came to Jerusalem. And this Seleucid ruler entered the city on a Sabbath, and he killed every male that he found. He enslaved all the women and children, and then he plundered the temple. He removed the altar that had been set up in accordance to the law and set up his own altar to the Greek god Zeus. And there was some sort of relic placed there, which was probably a meteorite. And that was the abomination that causes desolation. And then on December the 14th, 168 BC, we even know the day these things happened. No, December the 14th. Um, he sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. And if you know anything about the Jews and their repulsion at pork, um, you could see how this was an absolute desecration of the temple. This was more than an attack on the Jewish people. It was an attack on God himself. And huge numbers of people died. The survivors fled, and many of them joined the Jewish army of Judas Maccabeus, who then did what everyone had thought was impossible. They defeated the Seleucids, and they recaptured Jerusalem in 164 BC. And the Jewish festival of Hanukkah, which um, you may have heard of, it's also known as the Festival of Lights, celebrates this event. Meanwhile, that year, Antiochus, he died in strange circumstances while he was on a campaign in another part of his empire. They don't really know what happened to him, but he just died. And this is the uh, explanation, the interpretation, and the vision that was given to Daniel. For him, it was very mysterious, but for us, we can see that it's pointing to a specific moment in history which it very accurately fulfills. It's a clear sign here that God knows the future and that God is able to predict things that are happen and also he's in control of what's happening. And it's very interesting because as you look at this, you see that the reason that this happens, the reason that uh, the nation is allowed to be overrun like this is uh, because um, God's people haven't been following the law properly. So another enemy is uh, raised up and God allows the mistreating of his people. But at the same time, we see that God is in charge, and he, he limits the time that this is going to go on for. It's uh, just for um, that 2,300 days. So it's a time of punishment for the sins of the people, but it's limited in its scope, and they're being warned about it beforehand. So we have a clear explanation of what's going on, but certain questions still remain about this passage. Firstly, why is something in our past described as the time of the end? 
The second question is, what is the significance of the 2,300 days? Thirdly, why does Jesus look back to these events in Matthew 24, 15 and use them to describe what will happen in the future? Well, those three questions are three very good questions, and the scholars spend a lot of time debating different answers. Um, so, we do have to move forward here with caution, because Daniel didn't understand it, and he was skilled in interpreting dreams, and our scholars today don't really quite understand it. But, even though we can be, have to be cautious, we can present some answers to these questions. So, firstly, in verses 17 and verse 19, when it talks about this period being the time of the end and later in the time of wrath. Most Reformed commentators see this as a reference to the end of the Old Covenant period and what will happen to the nation of Israel before the arrival of the Messiah and the introduction of the New Covenant. So that's why it's talking about the end. It's pointing towards the end of the Old Covenant. And that clearly ties in with the clear fulfillment during this historical period. Um, meanwhile, those people who are from a dispensational background, um, they split these verses, with some of them pointing to Antiochus and others referring to an Antichrist. Secondly, um, the significance of the 2,300 evenings and mornings is debated. Does this mean 2,300 days, or does it mean 2,300 sacrifices occurring at the rate of two a day, one in the morning and one in the evening? which gives us 1,150 days. Well, the good news is, it doesn't matter, because there's ways of fitting in 2,300 and 1,150 into the sequence of events that goes on here. Um, some people look at it uh, as being based upon when the high priest is put in charge and taken down. Other people look at the time of persecution. So, um, that one we don't really have to worry about. And the lesson to draw from this is that God knows beforehand how long a time of trial will last. In this case, it's measured in days and will be a period no longer than six years. And this is an important application point for us today. When we find ourselves going through a period of trouble, we do not know how long it is going to last. But God knows exactly the time that it will persist for. And that doesn't matter whether that's a sickness or family problems, or in unemployment, or a pandemic. God has set a limit on it. God is in charge. Then our third question uh, was, why does Jesus look back at these events and use them in a way that suggests that they will happen again? The best way to understand this is what Antiochus did when he invaded Jerusalem as a pattern or a copy of what would happen when Jerusalem was surrounded by its enemies just before its fall in AD 70. If you remember in AD 70, um, the Jews had rebelled against the Romans and the Romans came in with um, their legions and in AD 70, Jerusalem was flattened and destroyed and the Jews were then um, away from their homeland for a long, long time. When the early church read Daniel and when they uh, read the Gospel of Matthew, they would recognize it as um, um, fulfilling recent history so when Jesus references this, it's serving as a warning light that these things were about to happen again. And it was a warning that was heeded by the Christian communities in Jerusalem. They abandoned the city in AD 68, just before the blockade on the city was complete. They got out because they knew what was going to happen. And uh, many Christian lives were saved that day. But it did accelerate the split between the church and the synagogue because the Jews weren't happy that the Christians had abandoned Jerusalem instead of fighting in its defense. So we can answer those uh, questions. We can see this uh, ties into a specific point in history. So we can understand this vision. <clears throat> we can do what Daniel really didn't understand particularly well. And we see at the very end of this chapter, in verse 27, how upset he was about it. Just look at his response. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. The Lord has revealed these things to us, those of us who live later on in salvation history, and that's a great blessing. And it's something for us to remember with gratitude that we understand parts of God's word better 
than some people in the Old Testament did. Remember, they were looking forward to a saviour and they were struggling to understand. Well, we're looking back and that helps us to um, you know, comprehend these things. We can also um, learn one or two things uh, from uh, Daniel's response in verse uh, 27. We can understand why he was worn out and exhausted and appalled, can't we? We know what it's like when there's something you want to understand, but you can't get your head around it. You know, it's bad enough if it's a film, one of those complicated films with an intricate storyline, and you just don't get it, and all your friends do. That's awful, isn't it? You know, but when it's a dream and you're supposed to be good at interpreting dreams and you can't understand it, it's no wonder that uh, he was exhausted and appalled. But then look what he did. He got up and he went about the king's business. Part of this vision has been the fall of the Babylonian Empire and the rise of the Persians and the Medes. And yet, even though he, he knows that he's serving a kingdom which is going to collapse and disintegrate, a kingdom that's going to be overthrown. He continues to do his job. And he continues to do it with all of his strength and uh, all of his ability. And that's a lesson for us. Because as Christians, we know that we are traveling through this life and we're going to be with the Lord. And sometimes when we're out there and we're in the workplace and people are being nasty to us as Christians or we're surrounded by our neighbors and you know, they're being particularly unpleasant, it's very easy for us to just withdraw or to not do our job properly or something like that and to just focus on the Lord. But first it's like this, a reminding us that uh, we need to be going about the things that the Lord has given us to do. The Lord has given us things to do and we should be doing them to all of our ability, whether that's paid work, whether that's voluntary work, whether that's just the general you know, things that we do within a house. There's all sorts of different things that we can do um, as uh, Christians, we keep our time full and we aim, should be aiming to do with those things to the best of our ability. Remember one day, Jesus is coming back and he wants to see his people doing the things that he has asked them to do, which is being a witness in that workplace, which is being you know, a diligent um, worker, whether it's for a charity or whether that's um, you know, at home, being faithful to your calling. So whatever your calling is, seek to be faithful to it while we wait for the Lord to return. Even though we know that this world is going to be changed and overturned, we wait for the Lord's return and we faithfully serve him while uh, we continue to look forward with a hope. Just like Daniel. Daniel knew what was going to happen. He knew that his people were going to be released. He knew that the Babylonian Empire was going to uh, fall. Even though he knew that uh, the end was nigh, he still served faithfully. So there's a lesson there for each one of us. And other things that we can learn from this passage, it reminds us about the great cosmic war that goes on behind the scenes of history. Our world is in rebellion to God, and every so often these forces bubble up, and it turns into direct persecution of God's people. Today we are facing an increasingly alarming situation as our society's understanding of what it means to be a human changes. And this means that Christian standards, which were once recognized as right, are now being seen as evil. It means biblical views of what it means to be male and female and how people behave sexually with each other are now being seen, if they're Christian views, as repressive and damaging. And the people who hold these views seem to have the media on their side, they seem to have the politicians on their side, they seem to have the general opinion of the public on their side. And it's easy for us as Christians to feel outgunned, overwhelmed and frustrated because we just seem to move from one problem to another, one battlefield to another. What we face today is nothing like the strength of the Babylonian Empire or the might of the Persian army or even the evil of an Antiochus. Yet God looked at these mighty human empires and how does he describe them? They're just sheep and goats. Animals that are domesticated and easily controlled and actually require quite a bit of human care. If that's how God saw those mighty empires, how does he see the forces arrayed against him today? I'm sure pretty much the same. The Jews survived the reign of Antiochus, but sadly they didn't learn their lesson. When that age drew to a close and the Messiah arrived, 
They did not recognize him, but they rejected him. They joined with the Gentiles to crucify our Lord and Savior. Yet despite this great rejection, God was still in control. And three days later, Christ rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. Now Jesus rules, and one day he will return. While all around the world, his kingdom is growing as people put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's an important point for us to remember. Today, lots of people think their problems will be over once COVID is defeated and we're back to normal. But if you can remember a time before COVID, was life peaceful and trouble-free then? No, people just went from one thing to another. And it will be the same after. There will just be one thing after another. And as Christians, we need to remember that there's going to be no peace until the Lord returns. We need to remember this and remember that God is in charge no matter what happens. Today, the forces of darkness may try and turn back the clock, telling believers that their views are no longer acceptable and they must change their thinking. God's people have been through much worse in the past. We know that God is in control. We know he holds the future and that one day Christ will have the victory. So while we wait, and even though we're going from one problem to another, we are people who are called to be faithful in our calling, doing the things that the Lord has asked us to do each and every day while we wait in hope for his return. And we know that in every situation, God is in charge and that he will carry us through until the day that we see him face to face. So therefore, as a body of believers, let us stand strong together, united by our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, and trust that he will carry us through every difficulty and every problem that lies ahead. Amen.